All right. Hello, everybody. It's Jeff Clements here at American Promise. Uh, we're so glad to have you join us today. And people are just signing on. And uh, we'll be getting going in just a minute. It's just past 8 o'clock here on the East Coast. And we are really thrilled to have uh, a, a, a really great gathering of uh, well over a thousand people around the country and more watching on Facebook Live. Welcome to you. Um, and a uh, big special welcome and thank you to Senator Nina Turner, who is with us, as you can see. And we will certainly be hearing more uh, from her in just a moment. Um, but we will also have Congressman Ro Khanna joining us in just a, a few minutes as we get going. So um, we have a lot to talk about and we will get right down to it. Um, this is a really important call because this is a really important time in our country. We're really, um, as everyone knows, facing uh, hard challenges um, in, in so many ways. And at American Promise, um, you know, we, we kind of were built for this um, situation. We started in January 2016 with a mission to unite and empower all Americans to build our strong Republican healthy democracy, starting number one job, winning a constitutional amendment to put power in the hands of the people um, and have uh, by, by getting reasonable limits on the way money is used in our political system. Um, we think of this often um, as something of the age of inequality in so many ways, um, where it has become the law of the land that it's okay to exclude some Americans. Uh, it's okay to use your power, um, whether money or otherwise, to get more power and use it at the expense of your fellow Americans. We don't think that's right. We know most Americans don't think it's right. So uh, we're getting a constitutional amendment to fix it. Um, you're a big part of that, so thank you. Thank you to our revolution, our co-sponsors, and Roots Action, our co-sponsors, uh, for um, joining us in this uh, important conversation. We're going to hear um, from Senator Nina Turner in just a minute. Um, she is then going to uh, tell us uh, a little bit more about the work and then uh, bring in Congressman Khanna for a conversation with both of them and with all of you. Let me just say one bit of housekeeping. Um, we're going to use the Q&A function down at the bottom of your webinar uh, panel. So we'll be looking for questions if you have them, and we'll try to weave those in um, with our, our speakers. So use the, the question and answer, the Q&A, for a question. We have the chat feature, too, which, of course, everybody is, is uh, free and welcome to participate in that way as well. So let's get right down to it. I told you a little bit about American Promise. and. Uh, we were so grateful when we launched um, that Senator Nina Turner of Ohio, uh, who I think had just come up as a, a, a inspiring Secretary of State run uh, just before that in the state of Ohio. She had served in Cleveland, where she's from, in so many ways. She comes from a family of service, I know, uh, police officers and National Guard and just a, a powerful family of serving the people and this country. Um, and, uh, and, and Nina came on our advisory council before American Promise had really become American Promise and done so much that we've done since then. And it was a big bet on us and, uh, and on the future of this country. And we were so grateful. So some, many of you have seen her speak at our conferences. Um, everyone in the country, I think, has seen her speak around the country. And she is uh, one of the most inspiring leaders uh, in so many ways uh, for the people of this country. So without further ado, um, when Congressman Khanna gets here, I'll, I'll let you know, uh, Nina, and we'll, um, and we'll introduce him separately. But if you would, let me turn it to you. You're a member of our American Promise Advisory Council. You're very familiar with our work. You've just come off um, a big uh, campaign as a, as a co-chair with Congressman Khanna and others of the Bernie Sanders for President campaign. Uh, many of the folks on this call, I think, came off that campaign as well. Um, and as you would be the first to say, it's not over. It's um, not just about one race. Um, it is about the future of the country. And Bernie Sanders was one of our first pledge signers for the American Promise Pledge to support the amendment. Uh, 13 presidential candidates joined him and now hundreds and hundreds of candidates around the country have 
and Azer Cole, who's our um, state's manager on the, on the call tonight, will tell us more about that pledge. Um, but we wanted to kind of pick off, uh, pick up um, where Bernie Sanders uh, left off with the call for campaigns that are funded by the people, um, not by the billionaires and the corporations. Um, that's what the constitutional amendment would, will do. Um, we've had uh, hard racial injustice and fights for racial justice um, in the past several weeks that are also part of this moment that we are in of the people insisting we will have uh, equal citizenship, equal rights in this country. And I think these are related. I've heard you say how they're related. And, and um, if I could turn it right over to you right now. So take it away, uh, Senator Turner. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, so very much. And it's such a pleasure to be on the advisory board of American Promise. I want to thank everybody that is joining us, that has joined us already tonight and others that will be with us. This is, I mean, people could have been anywhere tonight doing anything, but they're here with us. This really is our moment to do something about Citizens United, to just really uh, stripped away, in many cases, the power of the people, the outsized influence of money in politics. We know that money has always had an influence in politics, but that Supreme Court ruling in 2010 just took it to a whole nother level in a very horrible way. We have power concentrated in the hands of a few at the expense of the many. And so it's not just about, as, as American Promise talks about all the time, Jeff, you through your leadership and all of the people who support this movement, it's not just about big money, but it's also who has the most influence. And the way the system is structured right now is there are very few people who have the greatest amount of influence in a representative democracy that absolutely should not be the case and it exacerbates every other thing from having insurgent candidates even run you know take senator sanders as a very good example of an insurgent candidate that ran for president for the very first time in 2016 and people thought that he was not serious because he said he was not going to take big money the question was how in the heaven do you run for president of the united states of america you won't take super PAC money you won't be you know in the living rooms of multi-millionaires and billionaires are you really serious and that what that was the first explosive example of really having a people-powered campaign, thereby proving by running for the highest office in the land that you can raise money, small dollar money, by, at the hands of many people as opposed to raising bigger dollars with fewer people and have people truly influence and feel powerful within your campaign structure. This is absolutely important because you don't want elected officials to feel obligated or to feel as though they're being paid for by big money interest. And unfortunately, that is what this system has devolved into. And so post-2016, 2016, there really is no excuse for anybody to say that money cannot be raised by grassroots dollars because it can be and you can be successful. Take it from me as somebody who did, as Jeff laid out, ran for Secretary of State in 2014 and really got a taste of what it is like to, to be locked into a call time room, Jeff, having to beg people to allow you to do what is right is something unnatural about that process. And so we, the people, have to stand up and say, we need to do a new thing in the United States of America. And besides, the majority of the people are on our side on this. And we do need a cross-partisan or omnipartisan way of getting big money out of politics. It will make this representative democracy less corrupted. It will put the power back into the hands of the everyday people of this country where it belongs. This issue is all of our issues, all of our issue. And for everything that we care about, whether it's a Green New Deal, Medicare for all, criminal justice reform, reforming uh, policing in America, all of those things have a nexus pointing towards the types of people who are elected to office and what they stand for and who controls them. Are they bought and sold? That is the bottom line. And so we must, if we are going to evolve into a fairer system, we must, we must, we must eliminate 
the, influ the influence, the undue influence, the overwhelming influence of the few that have the most money over what happens in this country to the many. Yeah, well, so true. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And um, I wanted to ask you about the situation in the country right now, because, you know, when when we look at, um, when we built American Promise to win, um, and the constitutional amendments are hard, you know, the, the good thing is they lock in reform and justice forever. You can't, you know, except for prohibition, we don't repeal uh, constitutional amendments. Uh, women get the right to vote. Women have the right to vote. Um, that's the 19th Amendment. And, you know, a lot of other really powerful things. Uh, but when we look at how they happen, um, you know, how are we going to get two thirds of Congress? How are we going to get ratified in three quarters of the states? Well, that was true in every other amendment. The yes. unelected, all white, all male U.S. Senate did not want to give, you know, rights to vote to women, to African Americans, to people of color. Um, and they certainly didn't want to go face election because they were appointed back then. That's right. And yeah. all of those were constitutional amendments and they, the people made them vote for it essentially, eventually. And when we look at it, you see, you know, four constitutional amendments in the 1960s up to 1971, including giving 18, 19, 20 year olds the right to vote. That was a tough time as we know in our history, you know, um, between 1910 and 1920, another four amendments, some of those I mentioned, including a progressive income tax. We needed a constitutional amendment for that because the Supreme Court said we can't have a progressive income tax. The people said we can and got an amendment. So, you know, I think when we look at, oh, how are we going to get out of Congress? How are we going to get Republicans to vote for this and so on? Well, everyone had the same problem like that and worse before. And I think we're starting to see um, this, this sort of, you know, the social unrest, the breakdown of the old system as people demand better and insist on better and are starting to, uh, and, and the system isn't working for anybody anymore. So, that seems to be the moment when constitutional amendments go from impossible to inevitable, as, as uh, Congressman uh, Raskin, our good friend from Maryland, puts it, from, from impossible to inevitable. So I wanted to ask you, because you've been all over this country um, in this past campaign. I think you said you went to almost every state, maybe all of them. What's your temperature? What do you take the temperature of the country? What do you see? Are we in one of those moments where when we look back five, 10 years from now, we will be amazed at how much we were able to accomplish. What are you hearing from the people? What do you see? Uh, absolutely, it is the bubbling up of the people. And as we know, all great changes in this nation and even the world by extension happen because the people bubble up. It doesn't happen because elected leaders certainly got a consciousness. That's not to say that we don't have some elected leaders who agree with this because we do have quite a number of senators who agree with this. Uh, changing, you know, having the 28th uh, Amendment to the Constitution and, and members of the House of Representatives. But that change, the thrust for that change is going to come from the grassroots and not the grass tops. Absolutely, we are in that moment, the civil unrest, people really being in tune with, as Fannie Lou Hamer once said, being sick and tired of being sick and tired, people understanding that Things must change, that we can no longer tolerate the status quo in the United States of America. So if there ever was a time to get this kind of change, now is the time. And I believe, Jeff, and, and tell me, what, 46% of the people in this country, I think it's 20 states, maybe it's, it's a little more than that now, but we've had states that agree with this move. The yeah. people are on our side. We must give a spine to elected officials who don't have one. That's just what this comes down to. Do yeah. you have the political will to do this? Are you willing to make a sacrifice? Are you willing to run a file of the powerful interests in this country and stand up boldly to declare that the path and the course that we are on as a country is untenable? And that this, again, power and money in the hands of a few has gotten us the results that we have right now in the United States of America. And it was only a matter of time. Every generation we are faced, we, we, we have to face the fact that all is not right in the United States of America from wealth obscene, wealth inequality to racial, 
to racial turmoil and strife, to anti-blackness, to poverty across the board. Things are not right in this country and we have to shake them up. It does start with the types of people that we elect to office. And most times when people run, especially on the federal level, and, and let me just say in the state, statewide office too, he or she who has the most money usually wins. And that doesn't mean that they are the best person for the job necessarily, but we live in a society where you have to get that message out. And the way you get that message out is with the money and money can overpower, can overpower the will of the, of the people or the will of the many. Yeah. We must recognize that. Yeah. And that's what this amendment will fix. And, you know, I think um, we're going to talk about how we get it out of Congress. You're absolutely right. 46% of the country now lives in states that have formally demanded that Congress send this amendment back to the states for ratification. It has, you know, overwhelming support, well over 80% in the country. Um, and, uh, you know, in Congress, there's different, and I'm, I'm touching on, and you've touched on some of the questions that are coming up in the in the questions and answers. So keep them coming, we'll weave them in. And uh, those are the ones I'm, I'm, I'm sending over to Nina for uh, her, her great insight. Um, and, but the, the question, and there's a few about what the amendment will say. And then, you know, there's different versions in Congress, that's the way it goes, but um, it'll, it'll come to the strongest amendment, um, especially if we do our job as the people. Uh, but basically it puts power in the hands of the people and our elected representatives to have reasonable limits on money and in, in elections so that people powered campaigns uh, can't get blown out of the water by billionaires. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and that we actually can battle the corruption and we can distinguish between corporations and, and real human beings and, and those kind of rules and things like that. So um, we've gone to well over 200 um, supporters in the House and well over and 47 in the Senate. And, and those 20 states and more are coming behind getting ready for ratification. So this thing is real. Um, and, and, and our moment is really coming. I want to say, you know, it, it does take everybody. We need that 80%. There's some questions about our revolution and the Democratic Party. And I think, you know, those times of turmoil that we talked about, Nina, are real, also times when the old party status quo can't hold. And that's why I think you get opportunities for big people powered reform. And we're seeing that today again, just as the, you know, the progressive party broke out um, the Republican Party was born to do abolition and, you know, and, and, right. and so new parties and change happens in these moments. Um, we're going to have a, uh, a talk like this next month with our, our Republican supporters and uh, working on how we get more Republicans on board. Uh, we've found some really good, effective work to do that. So um, there are questions about the grassroots and, and not relying on the parties. And I think that's exactly what this is about. It's a, it's a citizen powered campaign that brings Americans together to do the right thing on this um, and, and sort of break out of this partisan divide. We're gonna have Congressman Khanna and Ro Khanna join us uh, very soon, I think, and we'll get more insight into the state of play in Congress. Um, but, um, you know, what, what do you see in the next Congress? What do you, what, what do you think people can do? Uh, we have this pledge we want to talk about, and I think, you know, it has been candidates like it because the people want this. So if the candidates pledge to, hey, I'll support the American Promise Amendment, um, people, you know, it's usually a winner. Um, have you found that out there when you talk uh, about this work, Nina? And, and are people, are, are, are politicians hearing this incessant, insistent demand um, that we actually get people power in the hands of the American people again and get, get some functional problem solving government again? Oh, absolutely. It, it's everywhere that I've gone across this country, people care about this issue because they know that it is connected to every other thing that they care about. And so one of the things that we can do across the country as people are running for Congress, bring up the American Promise Pledge. Ask them where they stand when they're at these meetings, you know, if we ever get back to in-person in meetings, but for now we're doing a lot of Zoom and a lot of things virtually, but call the question. Either you do or you don't. It's just as simple as that. Do you believe that the most, the, most of the overwhelming majority of the power should be in the hands of the many, or do you believe it should be in the hands of the few? Do you believe that corporations and other organizations and entities should be able to spend unlimited money in support of a candidate? Or do you believe that those candidates should have to answer the cries and the needs of the people 
of, of this country. It is easy. This is not, this is not hard. It's very simple. Either that candidate does or they do not. And that should be one of the measures that people use to determine whether or not they're going to vote for somebody. Do you believe that there should be a 28th Amendment to the Constitution? Do you believe that we need to undo the damage that Citizens United has caused in this country? It's either yay or nay. There's no middle ground on this. Yeah, it's so true. And, you know, sometimes the middle ground people try to find is, oh, yeah, constitutional amendment, that's too hard. We got to try. Let's do disclosure. Well, you know, disclosure tells us that billionaires and corporations are spending a lot of money in politics. We know that. We need that's the solution. And I, and I think when people say it's too hard, they're not aware of how much, how far this has come, but they're also not doing justice to the people who came before us, who won all those other constitutional amendments that were just as hard. You know, amendments really have made just about every good thing about our democracy um, possible, uh, including the yeah. Bill of Rights. And so, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds voting, ending the poll tax and so on. So um, this is really something that's not only possible, it's really on its way. So I think you're, you're absolutely right, Nina. We, we, we can't, it's yay or nay. And once we get yeah. the answer to that, we know, you know, where, where, where we stand with our elected officials. And we have a wonderful elected official joining us right now. I want to bring Congressman Ro Khanna into the conversation. Um, our, our wonderful um, Senator, state senator from Ohio, former, her fellow co-chair uh, on the Bernie campaign is going to uh, have a discussion with Congressman Khanna, but I want to just say a word. Welcome, Congressman. I hope you can hear me. It's Jeff Clements, president of American Promise, and I'm going to introduce you, but I just, uh, why don't you say hello to make sure you can hear me okay? Jeff, I, I can hear you. And you I'm, are, yes. Thank you so much. On. Thank you for joining us. So good to see you, especially for taking the, the time. I, I know how busy you are, and, and congratulations to you and all the um, people who work so hard to um, have you kind of lead the charge for the California delegation. Um, well, but, Senator Turner was a big part of that, and I'm so proud of uh, uh, the Bernie delegates and so many of the progressive delegates for continuing the fight for the issues that uh, we all care about. Yeah, and we were talking a bit about that. Let me just keep, um, let folks who, who don't know, and there probably aren't many, um, about Congressman Khanna, and particularly his, his work in, in this area we're talking about tonight with the American Promise Amendment to have reasonable uh, rules about money and elections. And it's, it's sort of a campaign finance question, but it, an anti-corruption question. But as we were saying, Nina, it's really about the equal rights of Americans to participate in our, in our democracy. Um, Congressman Rokana is one of 10, only 10, that's a sad commentary, members, but uh, a huge uh, tribute to you, Congressman, to not take PAC money, um, co-chair of the Bernie campaign, as I, as I mentioned. And uh, we've been talking about the American Promise Pledge um, and from Bernie Sanders and many others, including Congressman Khanna. Thank you so much for doing that. Let me turn it over to you to say a few words and, and, um, and maybe right back to uh, Nina Turner to say hello and you guys carry the conversation from here and I'll feed some questions into you. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for your leadership with American Promise. Thank you for what you're doing uh, to restore American democracy. Uh, the issue you have touched on is central to uh, everything in the progressive fight. If you care about Medicare for all, single payer, you have to take on the insurance money the uh, pharmaceutical money. If you care about a Green New Deal, an energy, a clean energy future, you have to take on the fossil fuel money. If you care about standing up for workers' rights and collective bargaining, you have to take on the extraordinary money that corporations and financial interests have. And unfortunately, this court has said money is speech. So you have basically this absurdity of billionaires flooding television sets, uh, swarming the halls of Congress, to influence policy. Uh, a lot of times they'll get uh, an amendment uh, or a section into a bill uh, surreptitiously a few hours before the bill is voted on uh, in a way that is not transparent. Uh, and that is the sad state of our democracy. So what can we do? Well, Bernie Sanders had the extraordinary ability, uh, as Senator Turner knows, because of uh, his leadership, Senator Turner or others, uh, to galvanize millions of people. But the reality is that's not possible for everyone. I mean, it's not possible for everyone to, to become Bernie Sanders. That's just an unrealistic expectation of democracy. So what happens if you're in a, a congressional district 
uh, and you don't have millions of followers, you don't have uh, a huge social media presence, uh, then you end up having to rely often on these corporate interests. What we need to do is totally revolutionize our democracy by making every voter a donor. And that's why uh, Russ Feingold and I and Bruce Ackerman and Larry Lessig have proposed democracy dollars that uh, Sanders had uh, endorsed as well. And the idea is simple. Everyone gets 50 or $100 to give to political campaigns. Uh, just like people gave money to Sanders, they should be able to give it up and down uh, to uh, candidates. And that would really be restoring uh, power to citizens as opposed to special interests. So those are sort of my opening comments. I just can't say enough great things about Senator Nina Turner. Uh, those of you who haven't had her chance to hear her speak, not on a Zoom call, I'm sure she's good on a Zoom call, but she's phenomenal in, in person. She was uh, one of the great orators uh, on the campaign of, of our generation. Uh, and uh, she has such conviction and was uh, uh, was the heart and soul behind uh, so much of, of the Bernie Sanders campaign. So I'm honored to do this with her. Well, I'm honored to do this with you as well, Congressman. We make a really good team as our other co-chairs too. It's just been a labor of love and to be on this justice journey with you, we are so grateful to have you uh, in that Congress, uh, not only speaking truth to power, but coming back into your district. And absolutely, you are a representative across this country as well. People, especially on the progressive side, embrace you as our congressman. And that is a beautiful and powerful and heavy place to be because it's a lot of responsibility that people believe so much in you because you believe in the people. And it could be easy to go the other way, but you are on the right side of history on these issues. And I am forever grateful to have been able to have the opportunity to serve as a national co-chair with you, one of the most transformational campaigns in modern history. That was our campaign. Well, well you know, I, I take inspiration. I learned from you, Senator Turner, so I, uh, uh, I, I have uh, such respect for your grassroots mobilization, your vision, your conviction, your your willingness to speak truth to power. You know, they used to joke around because I could be diplomatic and I'd be uh, out there, and then they said, "Okay, this this calls for the uh, uh, the uh, Senator Turner plain, plain spoken, let's do truth to power approach." And so uh, you have stuck your neck out there so often, and uh, you know the amount of times I heard on the campaign trail that it should be Sanders Turner as our ticket was uh, was many. So I appreciate your voice and I know you're going to have a major uh, role in our national conversation. Thank you, Congressman. If I could jump in, um, you know, Congressman, I know you have to, um, a commitment in, uh, in just about five or ten, uh, just a little over five. No, I could, I could be, uh, we pushed it back a little bit because. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, just let us know. Give us the sign when you well, yeah, I know it's an important commitment, so we want to make sure we honor that. So, um, but I wanted to, um, you know, we before you got on, we were, and I'm bringing in some of the questions that are coming in to, to me as the moderator here. Um, we were talking about the challenge of, um, you know, the vision I think that we all would really like to see, which is elections funded by lots and lots of small dollars. So it could be plenty of money, but if it's all small dollars, um, you're not getting the corruption problem, every voter or donor, as you said. Um, uh, so we see the constitutional amendment is uh, essential to make those systems effective and not get sort of blown out of the water and stop the sort of cycle of cynicism and checkout and unrepresentation that um, really leaves the field too big dollars unless you have a, um, some candidates um, like yourself, like Nina Turner, like Bernie Sanders who can break through that, but it shouldn't be so hard to get uh, people represented uh, as, 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 as well as donors. So, um, we, you know, we were talking about other amendments and how, you know, we go from the impossible to the inevitable and that you are one of now over 200 members of the House on board a constitutional amendment to help build that vision of, a, a elect, um, of elections in the future that represent the people better. Uh, we're at 47 or so in, on the Senate side um, but, I, you know, amendments are hard. We need two thirds of Congress and then ratification in three quarters of the states. And I think you were uh, sort of putting your finger on something with the kind of um, grassroots power building that Nina Turner talks about so powerfully and clearly. And I think, you know, we don't talk about it as much, but you are one of the um, kinds of uh, members of Congress who are willing to not compromise your principles in any way. Um, 
put fight for what you believe in, but also work uh, to build winning coalitions, um, including cross-partisan work that is necessary for this kind of an amendment. Could you and, and Nina share a little bit about, um, you know, what works in the state that helps you in Congress uh, build that effective winning coalition? And, and what do you see as the challenges of, um, you know, getting um, more Republicans to join the Democrats um, who are on board this amendment in Congress? Um, how, how, how can you, what can you share and what can we, the people, um, and, and lots and lots of them are on this call and seen this, what can we best do to help that dynamic both in the states and, and in Congress? Well, discussed with the role of big money, with the role of lobbyists, with the uh, role of some of the financial elite is not uh, just a, a progressive or democratic value. There were many Republicans who uh, had that similar disgust. Uh, they were concerned about manufacturing having gone offshore. They were concerned about uh, the decline of the working class and middle class. Uh, of course, Trump ran on draining the swamp and he didn't deliver. He created and ex exacerbated the swamp. But it's important to look at how he ran. And the reason that's important is it shows that the idea uh, uh, that our democracy is broken, that financial interests are con controlling it in ways that have hurt the working class, hurt the middle class, is something that uh, very, very many uh, people believe it across the ideological spectrum. So that gives us room to build a broad coalition to get the two thirds uh, uh, of the uh, Congress and Senate and the three fourths of the states to, to do something. One possibility that I've talked about to, to some Republicans is to combine uh, the idea of a constitutional amendment to uh, to uh, ban these kind of uh, absurd contributions uh, with some form of term limits. And I know Democrats are reluctant on term limits, but you know we probably don't need people there 30, 30, 40 years in the new gen next generation, grandfather in the ones who are already there. Uh, but we need some way of shaking this up because right now it is lobbyists and it is special interest money. Uh, I, I'm not wedded to that possibility, but I can just say that there is room I think particularly with the newer members of Congress uh, to do something dramatic and, and we need to continue to organize on it. Yeah, we've certainly seen um, at American Promise, we have Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, progressives, independents, all, all working together. And um, there's increasing energy behind this idea. Well, look, most Americans want term limits. Most Americans want limits on the mon power of money in the political system and reverse Citizens United there's the mirror image of the problem, right? Uh, more, more Republicans in Congress are ready to vote for term limits um, and more Democrats in Congress are ready to vote to, for an amendment to overturn Citizens United. There's something of a grand bargain opportunity there to get folks like you and others who are willing to represent the people on both sides to come together to get that magic um, two thirds support and at least certainly to identify who is going to be willing to have those kind of conversations and step up out of the uh, sort of constraints of the hyper-partisan divisions we have now. Let me bring, um, turn it back to, to Nina Turner. And um, w w I was asking, what can we, the people do to make the folks in Congress's job uh, at getting this out either um, uh, more, more possible or um, more, um, you know, frankly threatening of, of it being an electoral issue that they don't want to be on the wrong side of? Could you share, and, and I know the Congressman referred to your, your powerful voice out there, um, but you n can't be alone. You need us, all of us. Um, what can we do best to get, uh, to get this driving forward? And we definitely need each other on this one. Again, this kind of big change is going to happen because the people make the demand, and we, we can't be shy about being very clear. We cannot equivocate. This is a demand. This is a necessity. I need you if you want to be the next Congress person or if you want to keep your seat. To say that you believe in the 28th Amendment and the Constitution and sign on to the American Promise Pledge. On the state level, we can get members of the legislature involved as well, passing resolutions in those legislatures. Also, there's been lots of support on the local level of government too. We know ultimately the decision to get it back into the, to the hands of the states has to come with the Congress. And so we have to make that a stipulation of support and not be shy about doing it and make the demand. As Brother Frederick Douglass 
One said, power conceives nothing without a demand. So no need to be timid about this. This is a demand. That's, that's, that's how we're going to get elected officials. To, they move when the people move. Yeah. And the people are on the move right now. Yeah, you know, over 800 cities and towns have passed formal resolutions, 20 states, as we said. And, you know, states, they're not what, always what people think. It's like it's only progressive states. It's, it's as the congressman was saying, it's really a super majority, 75% yes in a ballot initiative in Montana. Um, you know, it passed the Wyoming House, a Republican-controlled House calling for this amendment. Uh, so this really is a historic opportunity, I think. We're in one of those destabilized, certainly challenging moments in American history, but that's when the big change becomes becomes possible. Um, so, Congressman, um, do you have a? Uh, can you both uh, share any stories from the from the road and the work and the lessons learned on uh, a presidential race, co-chairing that race, uh, where you see the future of uh, the um, revolution, particularly around? Um, uh, moving uh, uh, to a political system that's more representative of the people. What what can you both tell us about that? You tell us tell us something we nobody's heard before. What's what's happened? <laughs> let's get, oh, some, okay. let's get some breaking uh, I'll, news and some inside scoop. I, I I think Senator Turner is a much better storyteller, but I'll try. I'll just say a couple of points that uh, we came much closer than. Uh, anyone would have imagined. I mean, I think when people start out and they realize that uh, you had a Senator Bernie Sanders who was totally unknown in 2015. Uh, remember, at that time, uh, Biden was a, a basically universally known vice president and no one in the country really had heard of Bernie Sanders. And to come uh, to, to win Iowa, to win uh, the, the uh, popular vote in Iowa, to win New Hampshire, to win Nevada, and to come within a whisker of being the Democratic nominee against a two-term sitting vice president shows how powerful uh, grassroots organizing is, how powerful social media is, how powerful uh, the uh, ability to uh, organize and, and raise funds totally uh, in, not just uh, without the establishment, uh, but in sometimes in, in opposition to the establishment is. And I guess what I found most heartening uh, uh, on the road was going and then just hearing stories of people, uh, you know, the, the one that I uh, remember the most is a, a, a person, uh, uh, Robin in Iowa, who unfortunately is no longer with us, and you, uh, she was going to be losing her life, and she couldn't speak uh, at this uh, uh, event, and she held up postcards, uh, it, it, posters uh, with her message, and she said she was here, think about this, a woman in her dying days, last couple months, uh, because she believed healthcare was a human right, that everyone needed healthcare. And like that, there were so many of those stories of people uh, whose hopes for a more just society uh, was what the campaign uh, meant to them. It wasn't about Bernie Sanders. It wasn't about the coaches. It was about their aspirations. And I, I think if we keep that citizen movement, we will prevail. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, and you know we um, we see it on a, I think all over it right now of Americans ready and willing to step up to to show up even in that 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 amazing inspiring situation and I think by doing so we we begin to inspire each other and break out of the sort of cycle of hopelessness um, to really do some big big change. We're going to be talking about the. Um, how to actually participate in this work and show up um, with a candidate pledge that I mentioned. And Azer Cole is on, and he's going to be joining in a few minutes. Just want to let people know what's coming uh, so that we can talk about that. And I know, you know, this movement um, is, it has really got, it's not just presidential politics. It's there's candidates running at, at, for Congress at the local level, state houses, um, and the pledge works in all of those instances to help the voters sort out who is for real permanent structural change and, and who isn't. Um, so that is certainly um, going to be, um, in just a few minutes, we'll share how people can get involved. It's a very effective tool um, for, uh, the, uh, for having the conversation with candidates and giving them something and both information, but also an effective 
way to bring it again across the partisan spectrum. Uh, but can you share a little bit more, um, either one of you, about sort of the vision and where it goes in terms of the state races, the local races, what what you see for um, the, your vision of reform um, and people, um, you know, not uh, do, doing the work we all do to show up and um, for candidates and other ways to participate, but to actually get state legislators and city councils and school committees and everywhere else um, really focused on the people and the country, um, not sort of special interests. Well, the people are a special interest. I mean, I remember being on the trail with Killer Mike, Michael Render, and a lot of people criticized the senator both in 16 and 2020 saying, you know, he only sticks to certain issues, you know. And one of the things that Michael Render reminded us of is that the people, they were his and they still are his special interest. There's only one interest, the special interest of the majority of the people in this country. And so we have to see ourselves as that, the collective of us as that. We are the ultimate special interest. And that the power that elected officials hold, the power that I was blessed to hold, the power that Congressman Rokana holds and others who are elected or will be elected, that is your power. It is the people's power. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to you. And you allow us to borrow that power for a specific amount of time. Some people only have it because there are term limits, that, so they have to give that power, goes to the next person that comes. In the case of Congress, there are no term limits, so you got some people holding on to that power for a very long time, regardless of whether they just got here or they've been there for 30 years. It is your power. And so we got to reclaim that power. We got to seize that power back to make the demand and not be ashamed to do it. Also, we cannot fall so much in love with politicians that we don't critique them, that we don't scorecard them. As anyone who's been to school understands, particularly on the college level, there's something called the midterm. Where, you know, for me as a college professor, you let your students know where they stand and how close they are to getting that A in the class, if that is exactly what they want, where they are. And we need to do that to politicians. We need to give them a midterm grade and let them know where they are. And you can like somebody a lot. You can have adoration for people. That is a beautiful thing. But when it's time to critique people based on what they actually have done or are willing to do in elected office, we can't get that twisted. And we get it twisted so often. So the power is our power. It's our seat, our power. The money is our money. And the vision, checking in with the people who put you in office every now and then might be helpful. So a united, committed people to making sure that we get the 28th Amendment to the Constitution, which again is linked to every other good thing we want to do, just as the Green New Deal is too, because we got to take care of Mother Earth to be able to fight for social justice, to be able to fight for racial justice, to fight against injustice and fight more for justice. It's the same thing with the 28th Amendment. We have to get big money that is in the hands of a very few people from being the solid and sole influencer in our political environment, whether you're running on the local level or the federal level, but it is particularly insidious on the state and federal levels of government. Yeah. Yeah. You know, New Hampshire um, had a, a Senate race in 2016. This is a state with 700,000 voters, a $132 million Senate race. Almost all of the money came from outside of New Hampshire, from corporations and very wealthy people who did, had no interest in New Hampshire. It was a proxy fight for the Senate control of the Senate with the super PACs on both sides battling. And I've sometimes heard candidates themselves say, I feel like a uh, civilian in a war zone. I have, I'm just out here and it's incoming all, all over. The, and I think voters are starting to feel like that. It's been something like $60 billion spent since the Citizens United decision. Most of that money coming from very few uh, relatively sources. So it is, a, it is a big, big challenge. Congressman, if I could ask you, um, you're, you know, we don't all have um, the benefits that you have of seeing uh, uh, what, what actually goes on in Congress. And sometimes people say to us, and some of the questions are hinting at this, that, um, you know, this is the system that people got elected and why would they change it? How will we ever get 
the vote and now we could look to you and the you know well over 200 others who say well i want to change it i want an amendment i want a better system but what is it like to actually be in congress in a money system like this so you've taken um you know you don't take PAC money you you do you're an exceptional um example but it must still the pressure must still be there and what do you hear from your colleagues um do we offer a better way for them that they might embrace and really say you know i don't like spending 70 percent of my time dialing for dollars uh, can you tell us yeah. a little more about that perspective that we don't necessarily see every day well i think that the issue is not blatant corruption but and it's more subtle which makes it harder uh, to tackle and it's not what a moral uh, judgment, right? I mean, I'm very upfront with people. I represent Silicon Valley. It's an affluent district. It's easier for me to raise money uh, without taking PAC money and without spending hours on the phone than it is for someone in a poorer district. The question is, why do we f have this system that forces people to make these choices, that forces people to choose between uh, being reelected uh, or, or uh, spending hours talking to uh, people with uh, financial interests. And then uh, not only do they have that choice uh, that they have to make, uh, but they're being influenced by uh, these individuals because they're spending the most amount of time with them on the phone. And somehow these individuals are uh, have influence with the leadership of the parties. And so they're getting things inserted into bills uh, that don't make the headlines, uh, but that can have devastating consequences. And so the question is, how do we change that? And it's, uh, it, it's not, uh, I don't claim to be sort of morally superior to other people. It's a question of systematic reform. And the only thing that I have is I have an instinct that if you listen to people at the grassroots, that that power in the long run is going to be better and stronger uh, than the power of these lobbyists and interests. And so I think what we need to do is have more people who come and believe in movement politics, who believe that the locus of power is not in Washington, but it's outside Washington. That's why I was drawn to Bernie Sanders, who I knew uh, didn't, even if he got to the presidency, uh, would still understand organizing and movements is what brings social change. And of course, Nina Turner embodies that. And, I, and your organization, Jeff, embodies that. And so that's what gives me hope, that uh, eventually people will have the organizational power that will overcome the structural power in Congress. Uh, and as Senator Turner said, where someone will realize that if they're not for this, they're going, going to lose their seat, they're not gonna be in Congress. Uh, that's, I think, what it will take. I do have to jump to this other uh, commitment, but I just wanna salute you, Jeff, for uh, American Promises work, for the amendment. Uh, you obviously have my partnership, and I, I wanna salute uh, Senator Turner, who uh, you can't find a better ally and someone who has stood up uh, for people in every aspect of her career and continues to do so. Yeah, amen to that. And thank you, Congressman, for being with us. Um, and we, we, we will stay on and, uh, and see if we can channel some of that great organizing you're talking about into the pledge. Uh, but, but really big appreciation to you for your leadership and support on this. We certainly look forward to working with you. As I know, our co-sponsors, our Revolution and Roots Action uh, do as well, and so many others. Um, so we'll let you go. And uh, Senator Turner, I hope you can stay Thank for you. a few minutes. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Congressman. Yeah, I'm, I'm battling a fly here, so y'all bear uh -huh. with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let you battle the fly because we're going we're gonna to bring Asia home. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. Just temporarily, maybe. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to bring uh, our state's manager, Azer Cole, into the conversation. He leads the pledge uh, campaign. The pledge campaign is you and me and everybody else in this country who wants to help get this done, but Azer helps us do it. And uh, as I said, Congressman Khanna was a, was a pledge signer, as was Bernie Sanders. And there's a few questions. Azer, uh, what is the pledge? How does it work? So it, it is uh, well-timed. Come on in and... Uh, let us know what, what's, what it's all about and what we can do. Great. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Senator Turner, uh, Congressman Khan, and, and most importantly, all of you guys for being here. And my job is to make sure everyone leaves this call not only fired up, but fired up, I think, as someone put in the comments, how do we push the envelope? How do we impart change? And our, our friend Lawrence Lessig, who I imagine many people on this call know, a couple years ago, he did a poll and found 91% of Americans think 
there's too much money in politics. But 97% of Americans don't think that there's anything that can be done about it. And he said, that's the politics of resignation, which is a huge problem statement, but it's an enormous opportunity statement because we have a silent majority. And if we're able to thaw that majority, all of a sudden, drip, 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 we have a tidal wave and we can incur just phenomenal change. So I'm going to talk about one way, one particular way that you can have a big impact in your community. It doesn't matter if you're talking to a presidential candidate. It doesn't matter if you're talking to someone who's maybe mulling a run for city councilor or county comptroller. Through all levels of government, um, the candidate pledge is a powerful way, and I'm sharing my screen here, that you can really make an immediate impact in your community. Um, really, it's about the principles that we've been talking about here. And I'll show you the text of the pledge in a second. Um, the principles of standing up for people, standing against big money, the principles of standing up for a government free of corruption, and one where local governments aren't drowned out by outside interests who frankly don't care about the interests of the community members, but might care about, you know, housing developments for their big national um, real estate company or privatizing a portion of a municipal water supply through all levels of government. It's really our job, elected officials, and I should say most elected officials aren't going to do this without hearing from you, the people. So you can see that, you know, there's just up and down the ladder, fantastic examples of people stepping up, you know, Bernie Sanders and Congressman Khanna. Um, all the way down through all levels of government, as we mentioned. And I'm just going to show the text here of the pledge. And I'm going to quickly figure out how to change my slide here. And you can find this on the American Promise website as well, AmericanPromise.net backslash pledge. But you'll see in the first paragraph here, we're really talking about certain principles, all geared around limiting the undue influence of money in elections and governments. So we ask candidates to guard against corruption, secure federalism. And what we mean by that is secure the right of local governments to limit money coming in from outside of their local government, influencing local policy and securing the equal rights of free speech for Americans because you know a very well-funded minority of people will have you believe that money is the same thing as free speech and First Amendment rights, the right to speak freely in this country, aren't only for people, but they're for corporations as well. And what you're left with isn't free speech equal for all Americans, it's outsized influence for people who can't afford it. And we're asking candidates to through all of these things, take a principled stand, limiting the influence of money in elections and government. And that's exactly what you all are impacting day in and day out. And American Promise launched this candidate pledge program in 2018. And since over 450 candidates through all levels of government have stepped up and said, you know, it's a no brainer. This is something that I absolutely stand for. And it's something that I'm going to really feel comfortable talking about and be appreciative that I was approached by you, my constituents, on why this is so vital. And what the question is, well, how do we do this? And the good thing is you don't have to do it alone, as, as Bernie Sanders so eloquently articulated. This isn't about me. This is about us. And American Promise launched this program always with the hope that it would be a resource and a tool for the greater reform community, not something for only one organization. And so we're just thrilled that our partners at Roots Action and our revolution are helping us in amplifying this pledge. And we'll send detailed follow-up in an email tomorrow with specific instructions and resources of how to use this pledge easily and effectively in your community. Um, you can look on the website at AmericanPromise.net slash pledge as well on your own time. And I'll just flag that we're going to have a special volunteer training 
on July 13th, um, led by Ashwari Solohub, who's a um, citizen leader in New Mexico. She leads the New Mexico chapter of American Promise. And they've just been prolific. They've got over 25 candidates um, from city council all the way up to their you know, sitting member of Congress who've signed the pledge and said, yeah, absolutely. And thank you for asking. This is something that sometimes gets pushed aside for other issues, but we see the foundational importance. And uh, I just want to impart that if there's one thing you can do following this call, it, it's reach out to one candidate. And it doesn't have to be a member of Congress. It could be, you know, your next door neighbor who's running for the school board and, and talk about these issues and present the pledge to them. And it, it's not something that's tailored for, you know, people in Washington, D.C. I think as we've talked about on the call, you know, power starts in communities all across the country, and, and it really starts with you. So I'm going to turn it back to Jeff to close out this call with our guest speakers here. Um, but again, um, this is a powerful tool, and, it, and it's a powerful tool, not because of one person or 100 people. It's because of all of us, the silent majority that is waking up in this country to really when a government of, by, and for the people. And I'm gonna pass it back to Jeff to finish up this call. Great, well, thank you, Azer. Um, and uh, thanks so much. We, we have a vision, uh, we have a vision of our democracy when the people elect our representatives and are represented rather than just big money. Um, and we have a vision for this pledge campaign. Wouldn't it be incredible if anyone, anywhere running for office, had to answer the question, are you in favor of continuing this money system uh, in our, in, for how we elect candidates or will you sign the pledge? And again, as Azer said, we at American Promise are um, wanting to support your work and all the organizations trying to push this forward. Um, so take Azer up on the training and take Azer up on the uh, um, unbranded version and put your own organization on and let's get every candidate, every office, everywhere in the land uh, to answer whether they're going to sign this pledge or not. So I want to thank um, Congressman Khanna, who has uh, had to leave. Um, he's a real champion of this. And our great friend, uh, Senator Nina Turner, with American Promise from the beginning, uh, on our council, um, regular speaker in non-presidential election years at our annual Citizen Leadership Conference. Uh, and uh, we hope you'll be back at our next one when we're all able to gather together again. And uh, Nina Turner, let me turn it back to you to close us out with a, uh, your usual inspiring uh, marching orders to us all. Uh, so thank you so much for being here and I'll let you have the last word. Thank you, it was such a pleasure again to be on the advisory board of American Promise. Big ups to our revolution and uh, big ups to Root Roots action as well. And to everybody on this call, Aza really laid it out. To Congressman Ro Khanna, who is a champion. And again, we can uh, take stock in the fact that he is in that Congress pushing the agenda for the people. You know, I saw a question, Jeff, that we didn't necessarily get to all of the questions, but someone wrote something that read, they reached out to their elected officials. They're feeling like they're not being listened to. And I want to say to that person and to all the people on this call, when you're fighting for something this big and this impactful, oftentimes we're gonna have our valley moments. We're also gonna have some mountaintop moments. Some of those mountaintop moments are reflective in the fact that uh, for people live, 46% of the people live in one of those 20 states that have taken some kind of action, either on the state level or local level. We're gonna have some mountaintop moments when we know that 67, or, or not 67, but 47, uh, 47 senators, U.S. senators have said, yes, we believe in the 28th Amendment to the, to the Constitution or 210 representatives in the House. So we are going to get there, but make no mistake, we are going to have moments where it does not feel like we are winning, moments where it does not look like we are winning, and moments where we might indeed not be winning in certain parts of this country. But make no mistake about it. This justice journey that we are on is one that every single generation has a role to play. And our role is right here, right now. So when we have COVID in the, in the foreground, we have civil unrest based on racism and anti-Blackness in the foreground. We have people standing up to say, in the words of Mother Ella Baker, we who believe in freedom, 
cannot rest. So this is our moment not to rest and to ensure, to make sure that we do what we can, where we are, what we have. We don't have to do it all. There's African proverb that says that many hands make the light work. We're just asking for many hands across this country for us to bind together and do the work that we know is necessary to take this representative democracy to the next level. Along the way, we're going to win some and we're going to lose some, but ultimately justice is going to win out the day. And you don't have to take Sister Turner's word for it. Just pull out any just look at our history as a nation, any great movement that transformed this nation socially, politically, it was done because the grassroots, because everyday people got out there and put a little extra on their ordinary so that extraordinary things could happen. We are in that moment right now. So do not get weary and well doing. Just know that we are going to ultimately win, but it's going to take a lot of fight and a lot of faith, a lot of sweat equity, and a lot of understanding that sometimes when it seems like you're down and out, baby, you really are not down and out. It's just setting the play for the victory. The victory will ultimately be ours, but we have to demand it. And do not be afraid to demand of elected officials that what you want to see and that which you want them to work on for them to be the champion of because this can't happen. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. I'll close with a quote from one of my ministers here in the great city of Cleveland, um, Dr. Otis Moss Jr. And you know, I too, as a leader, have my moments where I doubt and I say, oh my God, why are we continuing to fight these same battles? Jesus Christ, I cannot believe we're right back where we started. In many ways, it seems that way all the time, especially when you're one of the many people in this nation of the grassroots really fighting for a type of change that changes the material conditions of the least of these, the poor, the working poor, the barely middle class, the downtrodden, the dispossessed. If you are in the hell raising humanitarian side, like I am, baby, sometimes it seems as though we're not winning, but we are. And Dr. Otis Moss Jr. said these words to me, and I wanna leave these with you. He said, Senator, the struggle is forever. So we are forever in the struggle. So it never ever ends. And for every hurdle that we jump, there's always gonna be another and another and another. There's always gonna be some justice battle that needs us on the field. So the struggle is forever and we are forever in the struggle. So join us in the struggle to make the 28th Amendment to the United States Constitution real. Join American Promise. Visit us at AmericanPromise.net. Let's do this thing and let's continue to fight for what is just, for what is right, and for what is good. Amen. All right. Thank you so much to everybody. Nina, thank you to you. So good to see you. you Take care. We're going to sign off now, but we're not signing off the struggle. And you make us strong. So let's go do it. Yes. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good night, and we'll see you again soon. Good night. Good night now.